Every year, countless thousands of ordinary buildings are demolished, smashed down to make way for the new. For many, this fate is unavoidable. But some are so special they're saved, carefully taken down piece by piece, stored away until a new home for them can be found and they can be lovingly and painstakingly rebuilt. These are not grand buildings, or always exceptional pieces of architecture. But preserved within the fabric are extraordinary stories, stories about who we are as a nation and what we have achieved. About the materials and the techniques we use. It's not as easy as it looks. And why we build the way we do. It just feels like you're making it the way it should be made. In this series, I'm going to uncover the hidden history behind these seemingly humble buildings to reveal there's not just the houses of the great and rich that have remarkable stories to tell. My grandfather was probably the first airman to die in the First World War. Goodness me. Well, I'll be seeing how these huge, incredibly complex jigsaw puzzles that were once buildings are actually put back together again. I'm here at Beamish, the living museum of the northeast of England, at the beginning of an exciting and intriguing build, and one that promises to tell the story of our national dish. Down below me in the reconstructed old colliery town, they've begun work on an Edwardian coal-fired fish and chip shop, where it's hoped they'll soon be serving our nation's favorite cooked in exactly the same way as it was 100 years ago and I'm going to explore the surprising origins of this seemingly thoroughly British dish. And I hope in the process discover exactly where and when the momentous marriage of chips and fried and battered fish actually took place. The museum covers a vast 300 acre site and is dedicated to preserving examples of everyday life in northeast England. Normally here at Beamish, it's the building like this schoolhouse that is saved and preserved in the museum, and the interiors are pieced together to, to fit the building. But in this case, it's the interior that they're desperate to save, and they need to create a building around it to house it. The challenge for Jim Reese, the project's mastermind, is to create a building that feels genuinely old. And what's the thinking that's gone on in the design process? I think there are two Victorian, Edwardian chip ranges left in the world, and we've got one of them. So that's one of the key points to start with. The other is that 30 years ago, we collected all these wonderful tiles, and so we've got to get a building where we can put both of them in and make it make sense historically. So here we've got, if you like, the, the typical late Victorian industrial unit. There's an office and the stables. And here our guy, he's, he's invested all his savings in this, this chip range, and he takes this building, he puts his, his chip range in, and it starts to make money. And finally, about 1910, he achieves his ambition, which is a sit-in restaurant, and then they call them saloons. Even our nearby town had two fish and chip saloons by about 1905. And so where does the kind of the authenticity come from? You could happily beam this building down in any pit village around County Durham, and it wouldn't even notice. We've got colliery bricks, chimney pots from the local fire clay works. It's got to be the real stuff of history. Well, Jim's plans are certainly ambitious, and he seems very, very confident, but I have a couple of concerns. The first is, is that he's trying to create this hybrid building, a sort of a jigsaw puzzle of pieces taken from here, there and everywhere, and bringing those together and making it feel right to fit in with all these authentic buildings is it's going to be tough. The second is he's trying to work with Edwardian coal-fired rangers, 100-year-old technology, and make that into a modern restaurant with all the, the health and hygiene standards that go with that, producing hundreds of meals a day. I think that's going to be very, very hard. And I just hope that he hasn't underestimated the, the, the scale of the challenge. And the first challenge is to build walls that look authentically Victorian, 
using a combination of reclaimed and modern materials. While work gets underway, I've headed to the museum's archives, hoping to discover something about the origins of the fish and chip shop. Goodness me, I mean, early fish fries had a terrible, evil reputation. The great Henry Mayhew, social observer, social reformer, had this to say in 1861. The fried fish sellers live in some out-of-the-way alleys. For even among the poorest class, there are great objections to their being fellow lodgers on account of the odour of the frying. A gin-drinking neighbourhood, one Costa, said, suits best for people haven't their smell so correct there. <laughs> and of course, if you remember, a few years earlier, Charles Dickens, writing Oliver Twist, had the frightful Fagin living in an area of fried fish warehouses. There's a good reason Dickens had Fagin, a Jewish character, living amongst the fish friars. Because the earliest reference to fried, battered fish I can uncover comes from the 1830s, when it was called fried fish Jewish style. In the Jewish communities of Victorian East London, offcuts of any available fish were battered, fried, and then hawked on the streets as a cheap cold snack. Baked potatoes were also sold, but no chips. The earliest chip shops sprung up around the cotton mills of Lancashire in the 1860s, using the readily available cottonseed oil to fry potatoes in what was called the French method. It's not known for certain when Jewish fish first joined French chips, but by the 1870s, thoroughly British fish and chips were spreading like wildfire through the country's working-class communities. The museum's director, Richard Evans, has been researching these first fish and chip shops. It was actually a really important source of income for people, and often people who perhaps were down in their luck. You know, they needed a second source of income. Perhaps their main breadwinner had been hurt in an industrial accident. So they, you know, they might have been serving fish and chips from a house like this, frying in the back, serving out of the front, right in the heart of the community. So you could plant a load of spuds in your front garden, get yourself a fryer, and start your own fish and chip shop? Yeah, um, there was very little legislation in the early years and uh, quite a lot of fires and accidents, <laughs> I should think, around it. But it was a real centre for the community. A family might eat um, from a fish and chip shop or a pitman might eat from a fish and chip shop three or four times a week. These thousands of front room enterprises in the back streets could be revoltingly squalid establishments, as another book in the archives reveals. Now, here we see an account written by a chap called Sir Shirley Murphy, obviously a bit of a stickler for health. Um, he says, the conditions under which fish are cleansed and stored are, as a rule, most unsatisfactory. Numerous instances have been found where floors and walls were fouled with decomposing fish, slime and excremental matter. Going out to the chippy, in 1900, was obviously you were really rather <laughs> taking your life in your hands. I just hope they're not planning to replicate those hygiene standards in our backstreet fish and chip shop. Work on the walls is already well underway, so I head over there to offer a helping hand to Kenny, the bricklayer. Right, where do you want them? Drop them on top of them, Charlie. Oh. I'm glad to see you working with these nice, modern, lightweight bricks. Oh, no, there's nothing like <laughs> about these bricks. There's no holes in these like the modern day bricks. They're a little bit longer, a little bit wider, and a little bit deeper. Well, you seem to be doing a very nice job here, so, um, shall I sort of muck it up a bit and have a go? <laughs> you can have a go, Charlie, yes. I can't say I'm a great bricklayer, but... That's all okay. I'm sure I'm very good at this, Kenny. <laughs> That's all right. Is that all right? Yeah, just tap it out. That's it. You're happy for me to put some of these bricks up? Because yes. everyone's going to think you built this wall. It doesn't matter. You'll carry on. When I get this back filled, nobody, <laughs> will, nobody <laughs> will ever know. Right, so this is going underground? Yes. Is that why you're letting me do it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these are colliery bricks, are they? Yeah, they were made at the old collieries. And all the local mines used to put in, just like you can see there, Howden and that would come from the Howden mine. 
Amazing. I had no idea that collieries made bricks. This is one of my favourite ones. It's not that I love them bricks, <laughs> but that's the only one I've seen with love written in it. That's a very well-made brick, though, isn't it? I mean, that's a much better-made brick oh, than yes. this. Decorative with moulding. Yes. That's fantastic. Within the Durham area alone, there were more than 50 quarry brickworks, producing the millions of bricks that were required to feed the building boom of the Industrial Revolution. Quarry towns of the northeast, such as Tantobi, possess a distinct architectural charm and quality that's due largely to geology. When coal was sought in an area like this, workers' housing was needed rapidly and in large quantities. The solution was rather brilliant. The shafts were sunk, searching for the coal seam. In the process, the overburden of clay that had to be removed to reach the coal was brought to the surface and used to provide the cheap and readily available building material. Colliery towns can possess a great visual uniformity because the houses tend to be built at the same time to more or less standard designs and all using the same colliery bricks. But bricks can possess beautiful, subtle variations of colour and tone depending on the mineral content of local clays. The incredible variety of colliery bricks are on display in one of the tram stops at Beamish. That is absolutely magnificent. It's wonderful, isn't it? It is. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It's an incredible colour scheme, isn't it? I mean, just like subtle variation, all the different clays. I mean, from this one here that's incredibly white to these dark, dark bricks down here. You can see the different names, the different ages, sometimes the same name going from a crude uh, impression like the F and L up there, F and L even cruder, Ferrans and Love in that lovely, accurate brick. It was a sort of an ego thing to sort of, not only are you working in my pit, I'm building your houses, but my name is like inside all of the all of the bricks that built yeah, it. I, Nebuchadnezzar did it, I think. It's, it's, so it has a history, doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? He did. I think he did it in Babylon. That's exactly the kind of vernacular detail and character that everyone thought that industrialization was killing off. But here it was, so local. Here we've got a fantastic fish brick. When we were building this wall, an old lady came up to Kenny, the bricklayer, and said, oh, when we were little, we used to have these bricks with fish in. So he rummages about, sure enough, there's the fish brick. And he said, oh, do you remember these? He says, oh, yes, pet, we used to get lead, heat it up, pour this into the brick, using it as mould, and make these little silver fish that they would wear as, as, as necklaces and so on. And that really made that old lady's day. She hadn't seen that fish brick for years. And there it is. Wonderful. Such an amazing collection. After three months' hard work, Kenny's brickwork is high enough for the windows to be fitted. This main section of the building will house the shop and kitchens. A wing for the restaurant will be built later using corrugated iron. Like the other Victorian materials, the windows have been reclaimed by Jim from various demolitions, and now all these elements must somehow be pieced together seamlessly. Inside the authentic colliery brickwork, Kenny's building a second skin of breeze blocks, allowing modern cavity insulation to be added. I've headed across the road from the build to one of the reconstructed miners' cottages to partake in some traditional chip chopping with Professor John Walton, who's written a history of fish and chips. When do you think the first was the first time that fish and chips, fish battered or fried, came together as, as a dish and, you know, sold in a, a fish and chip shop? Well, there's no hard evidence for this because nobody knew at the time that it was going to be important. Yes, yes. And there are various claimants from the 1860s in Lancashire and the West Riding of Yorkshire and yes. Mosley and Oldham, really what's now Greater Manchester, mainly. So, well, there was a boom in the Edwardian era, sort of around about, you know, 1900. And tell me about that. Really, fish and chips takes off from the 1870s onwards. 1870s, it's a, right. It, it's a mixture, I think, of um, 
rising working class living standards creating demand, partly because of falling food prices, and the supply yes. expanding rapidly because of the development of steam trawlers and um, refrigeration techniques and, of course, railways to yes. bring the fish yes. quickly yes. Yes. to inland consumers. So it's an almost kind of perfect storm of supply meeting demand and really churning things up. The astonishing proliferation of fish and chip shops in the 1870s generated a whole new industry, supplying them with cooking ranges. The early friars simply used clothes washing cauldrons, but soon companies were producing purpose built ranges. They became ever more elaborate and ornate, and by the turn of the century were mechanical marvels of true beauty. Only three Edwardian ranges survive, but Beamish has one of them. John Walton has gone to admire it with Richard Evans, the museum director. Yes, um, not necessarily from Newcastle, of course. It could have been from almost anywhere where there was a range-making firm. Mm. And every industrial town by mm. the early 20th century had its mm. range-making firm. Mm. It's one step up from the um, late 19th century basic ranges. And you've got the tiles, and you've got this wonderful decoration. In fact, in a lot of cases, I think these will be custom-made to the designs right. the individual friars wanted. Oh, right. That is wonderful, isn't it? It's, it's fantastic. Really These are the tubs in which um, the fish and the chips would, would, be, would be fried. That, that's the thing, is it? The, the tops, basically, the tubs Yeah, so you've here. got a fire under each tub. Oh, I see. Right. And you've got this equipment here whereby you can regulate the yes. amount of air that comes through. Mm. And, of course, getting the, 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 the right temperature and sustaining it, that was a bit of the art, wasn't it? That, that affected yes, the, the flavour. Yes, you had to do that by eye. Yeah. And by experience. I think of this in his days of high technology coming back to life again. It's really exciting, isn't it? Yes, it's really, really, it is, well, it's, it's, it's splendid, isn't it? The question now is can we actually get it working? The booming trade at the turn of the 20th century produced another great leap forward in fish and chip technology the mobile takeaway. Thousands of these horse drawn, coal fired carts once plied their trade across Britain, but now only one remains. It worked the streets of Spennymoor for 50 years, right up until 1972, when it was saved from the scrap heap by Beamish Museum. They're now going to fully restore it to live next door to the Edwardian chip shop. Is this it here? That's it. Well, that was it. <laughs> so you're seriously telling me that this was a fish and chip van? Because uh, to me it looks like something you'd find gently rotting in the side of a field somewhere. I suspect that's where they had it from in the first place. Looks like an old farm cart they've acquired. Because look, I mean, this is completely charred. Yes. The actual oven itself was so heavy that over the years it's physically twisted these two pieces of timber holding it. And what did that look like? Well, would you like to see the original? That's it. That's it. Believe me, these were not in this condition when we. Because yeah, these look found great. Them. Yeah. So these. They were. But these are the originals. They're the original. Oh, they've come up beautifully, haven't they? So how does this thing work? You have four separate coke fires. They're all vented up through the same central chimney. So that would have gone up. Yes. Through the top of the van and the smoke. Well, the smoke. Well, most of it really would have go gone up the up chimney. <laughs> You've only got that. Yes, they don't fit. There's a huge gap there, so surely most of the smoke's just going to come straight up into your face. It's very basic, isn't it? It's frightening. And what's your vision for this restoration? It's my personal dream to take this back to Spennymoor with a horse on the front, smoke coming up through the chimney, and actually be able to serve fish cake and chips again. Well, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And with so much to do, I lend a hand. There we go. Oh, beautiful. You really see the shape, don't you? The cart's frame was so badly deteriorated, it's being replaced. But much of the cart is remaining, including the kitchen cupboards made from old floorboards. There you go. Like a glove. Perfect. So, so how did this bit of the operation work? Well, standing either side of me were two coke scuttles. Uh, quite a bit of co coke actually survived. So did the original shovel. You would get your coke in there. You would lift your very, very heavy cast iron pan with boiling dripping in it. 
that's, that's actually a bit of a struggle for you, isn't it? It without is. Any it is. And I'm only reaching the near one. How did you get that one? And then, without spilling any, you put it back down again. And how did you not sort of cook your arm, reaching A to this one, and then even more so? Yes. I mean, what did that yes, one indeed. do? Yes, yes, indeed. And certainly at some point they didn't get it right because there's very clear evidence that there's been at least one serious fire in here. If you'd like to pass me that piece of wood down there, which really clearly shows what happens when you get it wrong. Look at that. Yes. That's been really charred. It's just carbon. Properly burnt, yes. isn't it? It's kind of mental, isn't it? And you, you're serious that you want to get it up and running again for at least one cook? Oh, we do, yes. Yes. You've got to do, haven't you? It's November, six months into the build. The walls of the Edwardian fish and chip shop are almost complete, and work is about to begin on the roof. The size of the building is now becoming apparent, and this is certainly no Victorian front room enterprise. That's because the early 1900s saw a concerted effort by the fish fryers to escape their reputation as a scourge of the back streets, producing food fit only for the lowest classes. This is a fascinating book. It says here, why on earth should a fish shop be a dark, dismal place, enough to give one a fit of the blues on entry? The walls, the author says, should be painted from floor to ceiling, an electric green. All surfaces, must be tiled in accordance with the strictest standards of hygiene. This passage is from a book called The Fish Fryer and His Trade. And the author is a fellow who calls himself Chat Chip. Fascinating. Well, we know Chat Chip was, in fact, a man called William Loftus from Sheffield. He was a union man, but branded as an agitator. He couldn't get work, so he became a fish fryer and made it his life's campaign to elevate the lot of the fish and chip shop and to elevate the status of the humble fish fryer. It's intended that our establishment should be one to make Chat Chip proud. So colorful, hygienic tiling is crucial. And fortunately, we have just the thing for the job. Well, this is a fantastic hoard that the museum collected from a fish and chip shop in Berwick. It's a... Uh, a really rare find, actually, these tiles, which are from Glasgow, from Jay Duncan at the time. It's that period of history in Gla when Glasgow was producing tremendous decorative art, Macintosh and others. Mm -hmm. So Charlie here yeah. is putting it all back together. This is the one we're working on at the moment. This lighthouse. Oh, I see. So you've got a bit here. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle. And a bit here. That's right. The beacon. That's lovely, isn't it? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before the precious tiles can be reused, the old concrete adhesive needs to be removed, and they allow me to work on one. First, I have to slice the concrete into little columns, which then need to be very cautiously chipped away. Be very careful with these, Charlie, because the, the body of the tile is very low fired. It's very fragile. Right, so the cement's really hard. The cement's hard and the, the tile's, tile's soft. soft. Yeah. A task like this really brings home to me the staggering effort and attention to detail that goes into preserving and restoring our building heritage. It takes me over an hour to finish just one tile, and there are over 1,000 tiles to clean. You've done well. There she is. Very nice. I've got these tiles here, which are totally smashed up. <laughs> right. I want you to remake that tile completely. But to complete this whole panel, what I actually need are three decent tiles. I want this corner piece here replaced. And this one here, look, has been smashed and stuck together in the past. And that would complete that panel, because it's a lovely panel. Think you can do that? <laughs> it certainly isn't something I can do on my own. So I head to Craven Dunhill in Ironbridge, the last tile factory in the country still making tube-lined tiles. Walking through the factory is like being in an Edwardian industrial back street, just the sort of area that would have been home to our fish and chip shop. Chief designer Robin Brinley is going to help me make the replacement tiles that we need. 
this one here. We can take the tube lining bag. Right. And that's filled with a liquid clay slip. Okay. It's brown. So it's literally just brown clay. Yes. Very yes. Well, heavily it's, watered down. Yes. It's called slip trailing, basically because you are just trailing slip. It's a bit it's like cake icing, isn't that's it? That's correct, yes. I'm sure that you will pick it up very quickly. Great. You're filling me with confidence. <laughs> OK. Ta-da! The big moment. The design has been traced onto a tile, and all I have to do is follow the lines. I'm not looking forward to this. OK. You really good. You have to give a bit of yes, squeeze. Yes, that's see, right. That's it. Now it's Once, whoa, too yeah, much. Now it's flying too much. You're squeezing too hard. Tube-lined tiles were the creme de la creme of shop fittings and were 30 times more expensive than standard glazed tiles. The technique produces a raised design, which more effectively caught the light in poorly gaslit shops. I think rather than fish dinner, it's more like a dog's dinner. What's next? Uh, well, what we need to do is introduce some colours. OK. So if you apply it around the edge first, that's correct, that makes it easier to fill in. No. Oh. OK. <laughs> so you covered it over, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. Yeah, Just so... Think positive. The tube lining allows deep pools of glaze to be applied, producing the most vibrant colours possible in ceramics. Hey. Done. Yeah, that to me looks pretty poor. What, I mean, how does that turn into, you know, these beautiful tiles? What's the next thing that happens? Once it's been fired, all those gorgeous colours will actually come through in the firing. OK. So, at the end, it will look completely different. One down, two to go. The Victorian obsession for walls of tiles in their shops reflected new scientific discoveries about the nature of hygiene. The concept there was a connection between cleanliness and health was well established by the 1860s, so the shop-going public wanted, when it went to food shops, to see the shops looking sparklingly clean, walls of tiles that could be scrubbed, washed down, no places for germs to lurk. This became particularly important for fish fryers. Their business was still under a cloud, so by 1900, and they were still regarded really as a smelly backstreet enterprise, they embraced fully the technology of tile-clad interiors to make their emporiums sparkle with health and cleanliness. The obsession for tiles extended, rather predictably, to public conveniences. Here we see a wonderful, practical and handsome example of a washdown tiled wall. It's January, eight months into the build, and despite a bitter winter, the traditionally made roof of the main chip shop is almost finished. The corrugated iron-clad extension has also shot up. Designed by Jim to look like a later addition, it will house the restaurant and give the impression the building has evolved over years. Fish and chip restaurants, known as saloons, began to appear in Edwardian times. They were the first restaurants within reach of the working classes. Soon fish and chip palaces followed, most famously Harry Ramsden's in West Yorkshire. With their oak panelling and wall-to-wall -wall carpets, they allowed workers to escape the harsh realities of their normal lives, if only for a few hours. Our saloon is far humbler. In the story Jim's invented for the building, it's a low-cost later addition, thrown up using cheap corrugated iron cladding. I'm not sure many people would say this, but I absolutely love corrugated iron. It is the most incredible building material. And while today it's very everyday and very commonplace, when it was patented in 1829, it must have seemed like it was from a very bright future indeed. It is the most perfectly functional material. It's very light, it's very easy to transform. It can be bent, rolled, formed, 
and it's incredibly versatile. So you can sling it over any simple, lightweight timber or steel frame, anything, in fact, make it waterproof. And because of these characteristics of lightness and ease of transportation, millions of kit houses were manufactured and sent right across the world from gold prospectors in California, all over Australia, Africa. In fact, there's almost nowhere in the world that hasn't been revolutionised by crinkly tin. The building may be nearing completion, but Richard has some bad news about the interior restoration. Well, I'm afraid we've had a bit of a problem with the early range. What? I mean, bit, 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 bit broken? It's broken. It was adapted later in its life for gas. And because it's such a rare surviving example from the turn of the 20th century, we just we can't really bring ourselves to, to damage it in the course oh, of... To, oh, I see, to make it, it back function in. would actually damage it as an sort of artefact. So what are you going to do? Abandon the fish and chip shop? Well, we'd, obviously, ideally, we'd like to use an Edwardian range. We do have one from a slightly later period, a 20s range 20s. that we've collected. So. Would you like me to show you that? Yeah, I'd love to. Oh dear, it's a bit of a sorry state, isn't it? The top's missing. Yes. You're happy, you're happy to restore this one. This is not that historic. Well, it's much less rare. This 1920s range here, we can adapt. Right. And we can get it up in working order. Wow. You're I mean, looking in slightly well, I mean, down. It looks like a lot, a lot of work. Is it really a viable option getting this thing up and running again? Well, I certainly hope so. Although it's looking a bit sorry, the fire bricks will be renewed, but. You know, the tiling will be, you know, restored and, where possible, reused. So it won't be entirely replaced. Fortunately, the fish and chip cart restoration hasn't suffered any major issues and the bodywork is now complete. Before the stove is finally fitted, the team decides a test firing would be prudent. But a few tweaks may be needed before the stove is lit inside the cart. Nine months into the build, the exterior of both the fish and chip shop and saloon extension are complete. We're now weatherproof, the weather can throw anything at us. Now we've got to do ranges, tiles, counters, get it going, but we can, we're just running now. But there's some really nice little features that I'm seeing. Obviously all the windows are, are different. That's on purpose. It deliberately, to show that evolution you've got, that you've got the sash window with its thought-out, quasi-scientific airflow, open the top, open the bottom of the Victorians, and you're heading towards, you know, it's the first glimpse of the hideous 1970s picture window with a, a top light opening bit. It's cheap, it's quick, you just whack it together. And, uh, tell me about the windows on the, on the corrugated tin shed. I mean, what are they? The corrugated iron extension, it, it fascinates me because those buildings are disappearing so fast. These tin sheds, they've been village halls, they've been chapels, they've been labour halls, they've been British kitchens, they've been all those things. And in a way, the, you know, they're, they're a sort of ominous precursor to the, the massive building of, uh, of, uh, of soldiers' huts in the First War. You know, the army hut came out of this sort of instant building. By the start of the First World War, fish and chips had become a vital source of nutrition for the working people of Britain. Take Bradford, for example. In 1917, it had 303 fish and chip shops selling 900,000 meals per week. That's two and a half portions per week for every man, woman and child living in the city. Fish and chips were deemed to be such a crucial source of nutrition for the war workers that government never rationed fish or potatoes. There was even a move to exempt fish fryers from the call-up. So, after years of shame and infamy, the fish fryers had come to be celebrated as national saviours. Work has now begun on the interior and the painstakingly restored tiles are being fitted. But they're still missing the three broken ones. Well, I brought the, some of the tiles. Now, this is what we were... Yes. That's the one that was very badly damaged, the sort of seascape one. Yeah. This was our totally, totally had it end of the boat. Yeah. And obviously there was a complete missing one. 
I went. It's a moment of revelation. It is. I'm going to just, uh, I went and tried to make a placement one for this. Yeah. yeah. Now I have to say, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. Are you breaking it in general? <laughs> <laughs> You've got the shape. <laughs> Look at it, it's dreadful. It's, it's... The guy helping me realised it was so rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but bless him, he had to go and uh, do oh, it properly. No, no, that's a bit more... So you can all relax. Yeah, and so then that's right, okay. that one. I mean, yeah. it's wonderful, the colour is perfect. And then this is the one... You know, the missing tile that That's we, the we one never, we've never had. seen. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, the bottom the, of the boat. Ah, oh, the bottom of the boat. See, Jim knows Look this. That. Oh, that is fantastic. Charlie is a skillful guy. He couldn't do it. These people were brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They were at the top of their game. They were famous across the country, Duncan's tiles. So, good try, <laughs> but we'll use this one. Is this the harder bit? It's a messy bit, which I think... <laughs> so what, just stick it on? Stick it on. It's like twist and make sure it beds. That's not going to fall off, is it? I'll keep a hold of it to get the other ones. <laughs> we don't want to break any. I <laughs> really <laughs> don't want to break any. That's fine. So that's going to dip you in the space there. Yeah, yeah. Right, this is the missing one. This is it, Jim. This is the panel. The one we've never seen. The one we've never seen. Okay. That is your panel. It's absolutely fantastic. It is a perfect match. It's really, really good. It's only when you see these tiles restored and, and back on the wall that you actually kind of get a real sense of how powerful and evocative they are and how bright and fresh those colours must have seemed to someone who's spent a day in the darkness of the mind. Imagine you know, coming out of there, being filthy, washing yourself off, coming up, getting a lovely hot fish supper, sitting down, looking at these evocative scenes and for just a while sort of being transported to a, to a distant place. The 1920s range has now been restored to full working order and is being installed. OK, Charlie, this is our latest discovery. What do you think? That's beautiful. It's in amazing condition, isn't it? So that would have been where the fire was. There's the fire down there. Yeah. We haven't currently got the pans in, but we've got the pans. OK, so, so you've got the, the pans. Yeah, yeah. The original There's pans. The original pans. They were preserved because they were soaked in fat. Funny enough. <laughs> they See, didn't they were rust. Rusty. It's very beautiful. I mean, it's really quite kind of small, though, isn't it? I mean, I think of a fish shop today, and you'll have like a whole counter thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this is, is not going to have that big a capacity, is it? It is a problem. It's sweet. It's beautiful, but there's two little pans, two little fires. The capacity isn't huge. Mm. The good thing is that we found something else that will at least speed up our chip production. Right. Come and have a look. Jim? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? That's a state-of-the-art chip tipper. From when? This engine is 1909 gas engine. If you look in the books and catalogues how to do a chip shop, in the Edwardian period, this is the exact model that was being recommended to the up-and-coming chip shop owner just before the first war. So how does it work? It works by the gas comes in, into the cylinder, it's driving a little belt, the belt's driving a little chain, inside here, the little teeth are going round, and if you want to pop a potato down there... Which... two holes? The big hole. It's a big potato. Right. And then push it down with your hygienic pusher, and out should come your chip. <laughs> Look at that! French fries? Yeah. Not bad, eh? So you're going to use this, are you, in the shop? With a... <laughs> this is a test bed. <laughs> it will be clean and spotless, and we'll have a hygienic plunger. Well, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Although marvellous, the gas chipper alone isn't going to solve the chip shop's capacity problem. 
but I've discovered that in nearby Winlayton Mill, there's another old, traditionally coal-fired range that may offer a solution. Lovely Evening, gentlemen. You. Lovely. Evening. Very Evening. nice to meet you. Gosh, and ah, oh, what a wonderful range. Yes, it's, um, it's well preserved, really. Uh, but, uh, but, but the obvious point is that you're not frying tonight. Why is that? No, well, really, the, the reason is because um, in 2007, our pet mother died. Yeah. And uh, she left instructions that that had to be the end of the business. But she really just thought that it was time um, for us to have early retirement and enjoy <laughs> life. And uh, <laughs> it's incredible to meet someone who's actually you two chaps have toiled with for uh, years yes. a coal-fired range. I mean, can you show me well, how, how it works? works. Oh, on the right. Frying, so yes, what we used to do. We... Put some newspaper in, in right. first. In the morning, sort of. Or, or, put, some, put some newspaper on. OK. And then you would put some sticks on. Yeah. Stir it late. And then once the, the sticks go late, yeah. you started putting your, started putting uh, your coal okay. on. So you've got fish there. Chi yeah, chips, chips in that chips one. Here, chips in that. And that's a backup. Yeah, that's just a backup one, that one. It's, it's amazing to think for, what, over 70 years, this yeah. room was yeah. the heart of the, of the local community. People yes. coming here to, to meet, to feed, That's to true. chat. Yes. Very haunting, really. Yes, there's um, grandchildren of people that used to come to the shop years ago were coming in near the end of the business, so there's been generations uh, served at this counter. Yes. And it's really thrilling to be here, by the way, and to meet you and to see this um, yeah, wonderful, been, yeah. wonderful machine. Yeah, it's <laughs> survived. Thank you very much. Since you're not frying, I think I'll pop down to the local pub. I'm Good sure idea. Oh, maybe come, maybe, maybe I'll see That's you down there. <laughs> <laughs> Although the Davy Brothers range is 1930s rather than Edwardian, it has the capacity Beamish desperately needs. So it decided to add it to the fish and chip shop, meaning that one of the few remaining coal-fired ranges left in the country will not only be saved from the scrap heap, but will be fully restored and soon frying once again. Well, it is an emotional day already. It's one of those days we'll never forget, I suppose. It's been amazing that um, we were found, so to speak, and uh, it's been able to find a, a good home and it will be well cared for and uh, it's there for posterity. It's taken nine months of painstaking work to restore the fish and chip cart and after 40 years collecting dust at Beamish, it is finally ready for its triumphal homecoming here to the streets of Spennymoor. And what's going to be fascinating to see is if anyone can remember the once famous Berryman fish and chip cart. I think this is really your fault, because you were the one who suggested bringing it back here and cooking some chips. So, uh, how does it feel? Oh, it's brilliant. I waited a long time for this. It's, it's the pleasure in restoration for me, is to make something live again and breathe again. I think we better get out of her way. That's it. It's funny because I thought that people might not remember, but everyone seems oh, to remember. Yeah, I thought it was the main, main, main thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yes. everybody used to come out the pub and go and get themselves a bag of chips yeah. or uh, yeah. a fish cake. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Good chips? Yeah, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Absolutely they're beautiful. beautiful. Yes. So, are you ready to go? I think so. Go on then, let's see how it works. Just be brave. <laughs> brave or foolhardy? Going. Yeah, it's going. Bit of a breeze on, isn't there? Yeah. It's definitely drawn. God, it's drawing really strong. While we wait for the beef dripping to heat up, the son of one of the brothers who owned the cart comes to pay us a visit. Ah, Hello, you must be Mr. Berryman. I am. Yes. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, Charlie. I've brought these chili lamps. It's been in the garage for 35 years or more. So these lit the van, did they? They lit the van when it got dark on a night, up till 
Yeah. Well, they are. That's a t it's a proper Tilly lamp as yeah. well, isn't it? Yes, is, yeah. So yeah. where do they go? Actually, I'm up on that, them hooks on the on the back. All right. Well, look. Do you want to stick that up there? I'll put that up there. I think one of the hooks has gone missing, so we'll just yeah. put that there. And we're back home. And that's yes. the back home where they belong. Yeah. Yeah. After half an hour, the first batch of chips for 40 years can be fried up for the people of Spennymoor. There we go. Right, kids. No, go on then. No, don't cry. How good are they? Huh? 11 out of 10. 11 out of 10 for the chips. Even the mayor turns up for a bag of chips. No salt. No salt, just vinegar. Oh, <laughs> there you go, I hope you like them. Thank you. They look nice. There you go. Go on, have a try. See what you think. <laughs> Was the Berryman van a kind of a really iconic part of the community? There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Anybody that came into the town, whether it be from Spenny Millway, or the surrounding area, they always made on a night for their chips at that van. And what's this here? That is the, the Berryman's chip van, Bridge. done by Mr George Teasdale. Oh, oh, oh. So you took this photo? The in the 60s. Did you? Yeah. Do you remember taking it? Not really. No. <laughs> I suppose it was a while ago, yeah, wasn't it? a while ago. But you remember the van? Oh, yes. It was in the High Street, obviously the Waterloo pub, that's not there anymore. In the 1900s, there was about five or six, well, about five chip vans in Spenewell. Really? Happy days, yes. That's an amazing yeah. document. It's obviously a really important part yeah. of the local community. It's the final push to put the finishing touches on the fish and chip shop before it's handed over to the team who will run it. A moment of truth. The Davy Brothers 1930s range has been rejuvenated and is being installed. Jim has also managed to source another authentic Edwardian gem. I never thought I'd need to explain, but that's a toilet cistern. Cisterns have gone lower down the wall. In the old days where people had hearty and thick diets, the water needed a bit of acceleration from on high, so you pull the chain and it came roaring down with a wonderful noise. This cistern's rather good because it's a typical working-class housing cistern. It's wood lined with lead. The toilet itself might look well-worn. It's actually what they euphemistically call new old stock. It is extremely old, but it's never been used. It's never seen action. It is a rare species of toilet uh, known from workhouses and poor people's outside toilets that was actually entirely made of salt glaze rather than white, expensive glaze. I don't think I've ever seen one in use, um, but we're going to see one in use. The rangers can now be connected to the flu, and the team has assembled for the crucial smoke test. If it doesn't go right, everybody's going to be looking at me. But there's some bushes behind, I'll just disappear quietly into the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fine. Should fire up. Oh, oh, I have oh, great... no. 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 Yeah. No. no. No, I'm staring at that. We're running out the door. Oh, there we go. There you go, Kenny, you never have a job. <laughs> Look at that. Eh? Look at that. Oh, my eh? goodness me, that's a lot of smoke. Now, watch him come out, the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> it's a highly accelerated Kenny flu system, mind. Yeah. It's more or less turbocharged. Three days later, the building work is complete, and the fish and chip shop can be furnished and spruced up in preparation for the grand opening giving Dan and me our first opportunity to see it in all its glory. And there's the bunting, all getting ready for the opening day. Absolutely. Well, should we go in and have a look? Absolutely. <laughs> oh. Here you go. Check this out. Oh, look at this. This is, this is the, the 1910 or so yes. range over Edwardian there. Edwardian range. Well, it looks sensational now. 
Look at the way the tiles have come up. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. It looks stunning. fantastic. And of course, that is too precious an historic object to function. That really is a museum display. Yes, yeah. exactly. This huh? wonderful thing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manual chipper. See, but what potato here? Oh, I see, yes, indeed. Whack! <laughs> Dwang. Complete with comedy spring <laughs> yes, noise. <laughs> Next on the tour, the palatial main kitchen. Good Lord, this is absolutely staggering. It's amazing. Beautiful. I mean, look at the tiles. I mean, they're the absolutely tiles. beautiful. The idea yes. that yes. everything's tiled helps reflect the light because you would have had gas lights, you would have had very dim levels of lighting. Terrific, aren't they? The highly reflective surfaces would have just punched the light levels up. And of course, with the tube lining, the raised delineation of it oh, catches yes. the light yes, yes, and yes. reinforces the kind of... It makes it so vibrant it? and vivid, very clear, defined colour fields. And you imagine slightly flickering gas flame, how it would be almost like a living thing, wouldn't yes. it? And the escapism. Well, it's like gin palaces, isn't it? Sparkling with, with gasoliers and cut glass. This was, again, escape. You come from your humble home, you walk down the pit, and you see this escapist fantasy world, don't yeah. you? The 1920s range may look similar to the Edwardian range, but that is less rare. It's been possible to restore it to full working order. A very practical, yet also, of course, ornamental, wonderful marriage of art and industry and and the utilitarians. I love the little scene here, this view of, the, of, of a hide and lock, I suppose. It's only for the benefit, isn't it, of the fish fryer standing here. Mm -hmm. They'd have just given a little bit, little, little bit of an escape. <laughs> and the Davy Brothers range will supply the capacity needed on busy days. Beautiful. 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 I remember, I last saw this when it was utterly abandoned in its old home. Ah, doesn't that take you back to your childhood? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Whack. Yeah. <laughs> It's just sort of all of that scooping and yes. salt flying yeah. around and yes. vinegar everywhere. I mean, it's fantastic. The dining saloon is far more modestly furnished, with reclaimed timber and exposed brickwork. Less is more. Keeping it simple makes it so much more authentic and, 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 and well, evocative, doesn't it? And Jim's obsessive attention to detail is exemplified by the authentically woebegone toilet. And, of course, it works. It does, absolutely. There we go. Lovely. So now, finally, the time has arrived for the first fry-up. And who better to show us the ropes than the Davy brothers? Well... Wow. There's the range. Oh. Dear. What do you think? <gasps> Fantastic. What do you think of that? Does that take you back a few years? Oh, goodness me. You're right, Randy. You're, you're... <laughs> this is your counter. And this is yeah. our counter and the, and the chipper. Yeah. Who used to light it? Who used to light Ramsey. it? Right, Ramsay, you and I are going to light it. Ramsay's technique is watched closely by Denise, who will be running the chip shop. Ceremonial lighting. I seize the opportunity to get my hands on that chipper. So, do you want to be the first to use it? Mm. You have to keep the potato that way up. I am like standing. A, and keep, I, I keep my hands reasonably well away from them. Um... Yeah, and then straight down. Oh, Lord, and then, then remember yeah. to remove my fingers. It should be OK now. <laughs> you wish I to feel do I've another. Done this before. That's, that's uh -huh. not a bad potato. That's actually. a great potato. And oh. doing them that way means you get a nice long potato. Oh. The other way, short and fat, I, no I, good. I, 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 I've got to experiment the other way. I, of course, I'm, I'm being very slow. Dan, where are the chips? We need the chips pretty soon. <laughs> good heavens, patience, patience. But I shall take it as a challenge. Let's speed up the operation. Oh, God, might get a finger in with the chip. Good Lord, Charlie, I like a <laughs> pinafore. <laughs> it's the only apron we've got, so... <laughs> Chips, anyway. Right. Supply. Right, I'll stand back. So I'm going to put the... I'm allowed to put these in, <laughs> Yes, put them in. What's the... Just what be gentle. You... Put them in. Don't yeah, hide them in. Don't hide them in. <laughs> to what, right. from here? Yeah. Whoa. Go on. There. There. Oh, my God. Go on. There we are. Yeah. Right. 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 In the stir. They are definitely cooking, aren't they? Definitely are. Well, we've done it. 
we have a coal-fired fish and chip shop. Well done, everyone. Well done, well done everyone. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well done, Ramsey. And here you that wonderful noise, isn't it? There it is. With the fish and chip shop fully operational, it can now be officially open to the public. Well, thank you for coming and welcome to a very exciting event today, the opening of Beamish's very own fried fish shop. Special thanks to uh, this very finely dressed man to my left here, Jim, <laughs> whose brainchild this is, whose head this building literally popped out of and is in front of you here today. So special thanks to Jim. Yeah. And, uh, and I'd also like to make a, a special mention to the Davy brothers, who's, who were, had a, a range, a coal-fired range, working in Tyneside until very recently, and were kind enough to let us have it here for the uh, fried fish shop at Beamish. To mark the event, I'd like to ask the Davy brothers to cut the ribbon. <laughs> Come on, then. in you go, in you Good go. Good you, Charlie. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay. The honour of being served the very first portion goes to Kenny the Bricklayer. <laughs> hey! Congratulations, Kenny. Well done, Kenny. Would you like Wonderful. some salt? <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll have to open a brewery. <laughs> The public are next in line. They're cooked in uh, proper dripping. The, the only yeah, thing far to put, it is yeah, far better. Better than oil and all these newfangled concoctions. Yeah, they are just as good as what we used to have, what, 50 years ago when we were kids. It feels very good to see that finally open. Very good indeed. It's the smell, the taste, the sight. It isn't walking around and looking at a, the world's oldest chip range in a glass case. All of us are used to fish ranges smelling of fish and chips, which isn't odd until you see one that doesn't. But to go in there and it's hot and it smells right and people are laughing and joking, I think that's great. I think everyone associated with this build has ended up very proud indeed. Because they've started from scratch, it's been an enormous challenge to bring together the rangers, the colliery bricks, the windows, and to create a coherent building that feels right. And I think Jim and his team have more than achieved that because they've created a building that clearly and quietly tells the story of the incredible rise of fish and chips. And that's an important story because of the, the fundamental role that fish and chips has played in, in working communities across Britain. I think at last to understand how this humble food has become of such national importance. Fish and chips is, of course, a very nourishing, tasty. It's always been relatively cheap, but more important, it represents a fusion of cultures, a fusion of the Jewish emigre culture of East London with the working class communities of the North. It represents, in a particular way, a portrait of Britain. And isn't it wonderful the way fish and chips started as a rather dubious backstreet industry and then blossomed to occupy splendid palatial emporia like this.